My name's Thomas, if we've never met. And as Scott likes to say, if we have met, my name's still Thomas. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out this week, man. I appreciate it. Simple, silly jokes. All right, we're going to be continuing our series in the book of Daniel. In fact, we're going to bring it to a conclusion today, only being in Daniel chapter 6. And I'll explain why at the very end of the service today. But Daniel chapter 6 continues this story that we've been looking at, where Daniel is ripped from his home, his country, and is then employed in the service of a foreign government. And many things are changed on Daniel, in Daniel's life against his will. And we're asking this question, how does Daniel remain faithful living in a country under a government that opposes the things of God? Is it possible to do that? We've said that every country, every culture really has a current to it. It's like a worldview or a set of values. In most places, this current flows in opposition to the things of God. And how is it possible to live in such a current faithfully? And we've observed Daniel do this in his private life, public life. We've seen some of his friends do this. And we said that they're doing it with some winsomeness. And winsomeness is not the sense of, hey, we're going to do this and everyone's going to like us. That's not winsome living. Winsome living is living faithfully in such a way to the convictions that God has called us to that perhaps some who are observing our life would be won. We would win some to the faith. But that doesn't mean we're going to win everybody. And there's the question that I've been asked several times after each sermon is, is, when is it time to just say no? Like, we just don't do that. When is civil disobedience appropriate? And Daniel chapter 6 is a story of public civil disobedience when Daniel chooses to follow God. The simple principle of how do you know when you just simply say no is found actually in Acts chapter 5. This is Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Peter and the apostles have been put on trial and have been, they've been instructed to stop preaching the gospel, stop preaching the word of God. And that's in juxtaposition of what Jesus had told them to go do. And so Peter just simply says, we must obey God rather than men. And so there's a principle of winsome living that's just really simple. When the, when the world's ways oppose God's ways, we follow God's ways. It's that simple. When the world's ways oppose God's ways, we follow God's ways. And Daniel has been doing this for his whole life. And here in Daniel chapter 6 is this famous story of Daniel in the lion's den. And what's amazing to me is every week we tell these stories and they're like really hard to hear. It's very provocative. And we have somehow reserved them to the children's ministry. <laughs> and maybe we don't tell them the whole story, right? And so here again, we find Daniel in a very serious situation. In fact, we find him near the end of his life. At this point in the story, I don't know what picture you have of Daniel in the lion's den, but Daniel is older than 80 at this point. Did you picture Daniel at 80 going to the lion's den? Like with his walker, just heading in, you know? No, Daniel, Daniel has lived a faithful life, and Daniel has lived faithfully through seven administrations and three countries. Just think about that. Remember, Daniel was born in Israel, and Jehoiakim was the king, and then Nebuchadnezzar came in, and then we've seen the successors of Nebuchadnezzar culminating in Belshazzar, and then Darius and Cyrus have now come in, and Daniel has lived under all of those administrations. And one of the key elements of the book of Daniel is this. God sets up rulers, God takes down rulers, God's kingdom lasts forever. And you see God's faithfulness, God's man, surviving all of these different administrations. Administrations come and administrations go, but the living God lasts forever. And those who are, who are tied to the living God live forever. And just think about that, is Daniel has been faithful in all of these different situations. He's not, ser he's not seriously spun up He's not doing things that are drastic. He doesn't train wreck his life. He doesn't just scramble every time a new administration comes in. Think, think of this in your own life. If you were born in 1981, 82, 83, you have lived under seven U.S. administrations since Reagan. If you were born in the early 50s, you've lived through 14 administrations. 
And, I, and you can just watch certain Christians live every time there's an administration change. Like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? It's over. And you're like, just settle down, Christian. Just settle down, man. Like, looking at the book of Daniel should teach you one thing. The God of heaven rules. And we live under his rule. Though we do participate as citizens in this world as well. So Daniel's going to teach us how do we follow God's ways when the world's ways are in direct opposition. All right, Daniel chapter 6. You ready? Daniel chapter 6 opens up with a new administration. If you remember last week, a new administration has come in. And Daniel is once again seen as a man filled with God's spirit, someone of wisdom and intelligence and desiring to influence the king. And so it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps. That's kind of like officials, governing officials, to be throughout the whole kingdom. Over them, three high officials, maybe these are like governors, of whom Daniel was one. Daniel's one of these three. To whom these satraps should give an account so that the king might suffer no loss. That just simply means the king knows like people want to find things against him. People want to bring down his government. There's, there's always espionage going on. And so in order to protect himself, he has set up this order of leadership. Verse 3. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was within him and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So once again, Daniel has lived in such a way faithfully to God that leadership of the kingdom recognizes who Daniel is, his abilities because he's a, he's a man of God, and it elevates him to a place of leadership to bring flourishment to humanity. Daniel chapter 6, verse 4. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a grounds for complaint against Daniel. Like now, people who normally don't get along are getting along and any fault because he was faithful and no error, sorry, against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. So these other governing officials that are probably jealous of Daniel, who are not won over to Daniel, who hate Daniel and would like to remove Daniel, get together and form these political alliances to get rid of Daniel. And they, they create this hit job, essentially, of let's dig up dirt on Daniel so that we can get rid of him. See, if you live winsomely, not everyone's going to like you, just like we said. The, the apostle Paul writes to Timothy, this is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Everyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Everybody. That includes you, that includes me. And so we shouldn't be surprised when fiery trials like this come upon us, like Peter says, as though something odd was happening. This is what's going to happen in all of our lives. And it's happening to Daniel here. And so they, they, they create this like political hit on him. Let's go dig up dirt. Let's open up the HR files and see who filed a complaint against him. Let's find out which relationships he had inappropriate affairs with. Let's find out where he hid money, where he stole things. And they open up his HR file and it's just the envelope. There's nothing in it. How great would this be of, of Christian leaders today? Man. For the world to open up Christian leaders' envelopes and find them empty. But instead, it's just so sad that many Christian leaders just open up and let's look at the way that they led their church and they're just leading in anger and have inappropriate relationships with, with people on staff. And then we find about, out about embezzlement or, or taking funds. It's like, oh, well, it's easy to find fault with these things. 
But how would it be if if the Christian leaders today, if you and I lived lives like Daniel, where they open up our files and they're empty? There's nothing to bring an accusation against you. They simply conclude this. If we're going to find something about Daniel, if we're going to criminalize him, it's going to have to be found in conjunction with his faith in God. And so because Daniel's not a criminal... We have to change the laws now to make him a criminal. And that will happen to Christians in this world where your faithfulness to God today is legal and then one day changed to what you're doing today is illegal. And it's not because you are a criminal. It's because the laws have been changed to make you a criminal. What do you do? Well, Daniel, Daniel has a plan. So here's, here's, their, here's their plan first. Then these officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, Oh, King Darius, live forever. Like they're just flattering him. What's, what's, what's the issue that we found with most of the, the kings in Daniel? What's their character flaw? Pride, right? So they're playing to his pride. And man, pride can really mess us up. We start believing our own headlines. And so here they come in, Oh, Dar- Dar- uh, Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps and the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. First thing, this king has a den of lions. Like, man, that just seems like... Austin Powers-esque, right? Like, we have sharks with lasers. What should we do with them? Like, here is this king. He's like, we have a den of lions. Awesome. They have a den of lions. And so here they are trying to leverage this king to use this execution system in their favor. Like, they can't just throw anyone in the den of lions. And so they come to him and they flatter him. King, you, you are so good. And now the king has set them up so that he wouldn't get played, right? Protect himself so he wouldn't come to harm. But his eyes are not privy to their scheme because he's intoxicated with his pride once again. This king should have been like a good mother. Like when your kids come to you and they're like, Mom, you're the best. Like, you look so good today. Everybody loves you. Like, your ways are the best ways. What does a mom say? What do you want? Like, what? What do you want? I've already said no to you. Like, you're trying to butter me up. And, and this is what they're doing. Oh, King Darius, you are the best. No one should worship anyone but you because you are number one. And he starts believing all of his headlines. And so he puts into effect this law that cannot be changed. Verse 8, now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and to the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. So now he is under the law. He's not above the law now. He's under the law and has to follow these things. Verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, So Daniel's not acting in ignorance. He doesn't find out later that his actions now are going to be criminal. He knows this. This is the civil disobedience piece. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petitions and pleas before God. And they're going to scurry off and tell the king. This is a setup. It's a pure setup to do away with someone that they do not like. And the only fault they can find in this man is his faithfulness to God. So when when Daniel hears that the document has been signed, that it's illegal now to pray and make petition to anyone besides the king, the first thing he does is what? He goes and prays. Now here's the thing. The first thing he does is what he's already been doing. This is not the time that Daniel begins a prayer life. 
This is oftentimes how, how we as Christians respond. When all else fails, when I have done everything I could, well, let's pray. That's not Daniel. Daniel's the one that goes, retreats to his prayer life that's already established. You saw it in the text. He prays three times a day with his windows open towards Jerusalem. And his prayers, look at his prayers. He gives thanks first. You think about that? Like the document signed, the first thing Daniel does is he kneels down and he gives thanks to God. Is that the first thing we would do in the middle of a crisis? The first thing he does is he gives thanks. And then in his prayers, there are pleas and petitions. But he, he retreats to what he has already been doing. Because here's the truth. Character is not built in the middle of a crisis. A crisis does not establish your character. It simply reveals it. It just reveals it. Like Everybody is like a Gatorade water bottle. You just don't know what's inside until it's squeezed. And when your life is squeezed, whatever character, whatever prayer life, whatever faithfulness you've already been practicing, it's just going to come out. And so if you're not right now in the lion's den, this is the time that you develop an internal character of faithfulness with God so that when life squeezes, something else besides us comes out. We want our faith to come out. We want our assurance in God to come out. We want our confidence in the Lord to be revealed. And that's what's revealed in Daniel. It's not beginning now. He runs to the thing that he's already been doing three times a day for 80 years. I just love that. There, there, are, there are saints in this room that are 80. And the fact that they're still Christians and love Christ and follow Christ, I call you my superheroes. Like, you're what I want to, I, I'm aspiring to become. Someone who's in their 80s, completely convinced that Christ is Lord and living their life faithfully. That's Daniel. And he didn't do it on accident. He's done this intentionally every single day, multiple times, praying to the Lord. Let me just ask you, where's your prayer life at right now? Like, where is your devotions right now? Remember when we got to use the excuse, I just don't have time, I'm so busy. And then COVID came and shut your life down and you didn't have to commute anywhere anymore and no one wanted to come over anyway and no one wanted to have you over to their house and you were given this blank check of time and no one improved their prayer life. Remember that? Maybe it was just an excuse we were using for why we weren't praying, but it wasn't the root issue. So let me just ask you, where are you with the Lord? Now is the time to develop the character and faithfulness to God before the crisis squeezes in on you. Daniel retreats to do the thing he's always been doing. And so they go and they tell Darius, this, you, you've signed this law. Now Daniel has been a lawbreaker Verse 14, then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. See, see, Daniel has won over the heart of the king. The way in which Daniel has lived, Darius loves him. And Darius just found out he got played. And he does everything he possibly can to save Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. The king put all of these people in place so that he wouldn't suffer a loss. And now he suffered loss at the cost of his own number one man. Chapter 6, verse 16. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. I love this. A pagan king who knows Daniel's faith. He's aware of how Daniel has lived. He has not lived his faith privately. So here's Darius saying, Daniel, may the God that you're devoted to, that you love, may he be able to save you. He delivers Daniel over to the hands of God. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. 
Normally the, the king sits and is fed and served, but he rejects all of that. No diversions were brought to him. The sleep fled from him. Then at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. He's running to the den early in the morning. And he came near the den where Daniel was. He cried out in a, in a tone of anguish. The, ding, the king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able? Who wants to find out, can, can God do this? Has he been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angels and shut the mouths, the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. So here, here's the story that, you, that you're familiar with, maybe. That here's a man of faithfulness that is set up to become a criminal, so that he would be put to death, so that their political ambitions could be met, and the king who loved Daniel has to follow the rule of law and throw him in this den of lions. And yet God proves to be able to shut their mouths. And, and we look at this and go, man, that's amazing. Like Daniel is cast into a pit and the mouths of the lions are shut. And at first I think, man, we always emphasize the fact that it's a miracle that the lions' mouths were shut. And I, I think now it's a miracle that Daniel's hip wasn't broken, like falling in, you know? <laughs> Just kidding. Just want to make sure you're awake. But the question is this. Is God able? Because you know, if, if they're planning and scheming to get rid of Daniel, it doesn't happen just one day. Daniel's faced with these threats daily. He's probably antagonized at work daily. He's probably tried to be falsely accused daily. There are people that intend him violence Daily, He's been living with this for a long time. The story of the lion's den isn't simply that Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. The story of Daniel is that he lives in a den of lions, wanting to devour him daily. And if you've ever lived there, it's a terrifying place. It's like, God, are you able? It's a lonely place. God, do you see me? And then you're praying, and it just seems like this is landing on deaf ears until the Lord answers you. Now, I know Daniel's story just seems so far removed of, of civil disobedience, praying to the Lord, and the Lord rescuing him. But there are many, many modern examples. I'll give you one from the story of Martin Luther King Jr. Right after they had begun the Montgomery boycotts, which happened in December of 55, going into the year of 56, they were down in Alabama, and they were protesting in civil disobedience racial discrimination of public transportation. And it had gotten pretty bad. And Martin Luther King Jr., who's also a preacher, gave this message on Sunday morning entitled, Our God is Able. This is what Luther writes. After the Montgomery bus protests had been undertaken, we began to receive threatening phone calls and letters. At first, I took them in my stride, but as the weeks passed, I realized that many of the threats were in earnest. I felt myself growing in fear. After a particularly strenuous day, I settled in bed at a late hour when the telephone rang. An angry voice said, listen, expletive, We've taken all we want from you. Before next week, you'll be sorry you ever came to Montgomery. I could not sleep, he said. It seemed that all my fears had come down on me at once. I was ready to give up. In this state of exhaustion, when my courage had almost gone, I determined to take my problem to God. I bowed and I prayed aloud. I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right. But now I am afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership. But if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. 
I am at the end of my powers. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. At that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine. As I had never before experienced it, it seemed as though I heard an inner voice saying, stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth. God will be at your side forever. Almost at once, my fears began to pass from me. The outer situation remained the same, but God had given me an inner calm. Three nights later, our home was bombed. Strangely enough, I accepted the word of the bombing calmly. My experience with God had given me new strength and trust. I knew now that God is able to give us the interior resources to face the storms of life. I see, this is, this is a common experience for the men and women of faith. That they are antagonized, persecuted, oppressed, and it feels isolating. It feels like you're the only one standing up for righteousness, for the truth, for the things of God. And the first place to go is the place we should have already been in our prayer life with God, that he would strengthen the interior of your soul for the storms of life, to have a calming presence come over you and say, ah, new administration, same story. God is faithful. Now you hear that, and you think of Daniel and go, well, he got delivered, (laughs) like... He got to be saved. I don't know if Daniel thought that. I wonder if after 80 years, he's like, what does a guy got to do to get out of here? But the Lord preserves his life again. But that's not true of everyone that we celebrate of their great faith. Hebrews chapter 11 recounts all of these dear saints of great faith and wonderful deeds that they saw God do. Verse 32 kind of gets to the end of this list of Abraham and Isaac and David and just goes on and on. And then verse 32 says, And what more shall I say, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and of David and of Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Then 36, others... Their story didn't end that way. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Not everybody's story ends like Daniel's story. Some the mouths of lions are not shut. But here's the good news. Jesus is the better Daniel. God loves you so much and wants you know, to know the victory, either in preservation of life or the giving up of life, that his son Jesus Christ came to live as an exile of heaven in earth, as a foreigner, a sojourner, a life of faithfulness to his God. And Daniel's story simply just foreshadows what Jesus would do ultimately for all people who would believe in him. You see, see, Jesus had conspirators against him. Judas, who betrayed him. The religious leaders that conspired to kill him. Political alliances of Pilate and Herod that came together to put Jesus to death. Jesus lived in the lion's den and was cast on the cross. But the mouths were not shut, and the cross devoured him for your sake and for mine. And he was put to death into a, into a grave, and a stone was rolled over it and sealed its entrance, just like in the story of Daniel. And it was sealed with the soldiers of Rome guarding it so that no one could enter and steal his body. And three days later, at the break of dawn, it wasn't the king, Darius, running, but it was Mary and the women coming to the tomb. And there they saw the stone rolled away and Jesus, the Christ, alive. 
that God resurrected his son so that all who would believe in him, though they die, yet will they truly forever live. And so no, no matter whether your story of standing up for God's laws and the righteousness of God ends in victory or in death, Christ holds the victory of all and all who are in Christ live victorious. Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and has been defeated. It's wonderful news that Christ has set us free from any let den of lions we could possibly find ourselves in, for he is the better Daniel. And this is our hope. And so the book, uh, chapter six, ends here with Darius giving another pronouncement. Like, this is the theme of Daniel of who is God? Who is the God that we're supposed to recognize and serve? And so, again, here in chapter six, Starting in verse 25, it says, Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that as in my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. And then I think we should all just read this together. For he is the living God. Enduring forever, his kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. That's the story of Daniel. That we serve the God whose dominion is over all, whose kingdom is from generation to to generation, the beginning to the end. And his son Christ has come to give all of those who belong to him victory over death. Oh, it's so, it's so good to be reminded of our confidence, sure and true, to be able to face whatever comes next. Now, here's how I'd like to end today is... The story of Daniel revolves around Daniel and his friends who are taken into public service in the Babylonian Empire. And there they have to be faithful stewards working in government. And they don't keep their faith private, but they're able to live in such a way with insight and wisdom with the Spirit of God filling them that is faithful and true. And I just had on my heart so many people here at Calvary that work in the sector of, of public service. And so what I'd like to do is, if you'd be willing, if, if you work in as a, as a first responder, law enforcement, fireman, paramedic, if you work in the schools as a, as a teacher, administrator, if you work with the city, if you work in local, state, or national government, if you work in some sort of public Sector, would you be willing just to stand? And I just want us to pray for you as we conclude our series. All right, if you're nearby somebody, maybe you just put your hand on their shoulder. And let's just pray for this. Because we want to live in such a way that draws the attention to the love of God. And so, Father, we just come before you, and I think of these women and think of these men who serve us, like they're public servants. And they serve our, our city and they serve our state and our country. And it's not always easy, Lord, to hold the positions that they hold. And if it goes well with them, it goes well with us. And so, Father, I pray that you would put your hand of blessing on them, that you would mark them out like Daniel's, that those who serve with them and over them see their faithfulness. I pray that you would bless their work. I pray that more good would come from them and their office and their position than anyone else that serves with them. So that, so that many would come to know the name of God, the love of Jesus Christ, 
the salvation for them. And so, Father, I just pray that you would guard them, that you would guard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray that you would keep them humble. I pray that you would keep them teachable. Father, I pray that you would continue to use them for your purposes. Give them great courage and strength and confidence for the days ahead. And I pray that too for all my friends in this room, no matter where they work, no matter where they live. Father, I pray that we would be salt and light in this world, faithful to the things of God, confident that you will see us through. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen.